We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Okay, so maybe let's begin um, yeah. our panel uh, discussion here. So my name is Ilona Urbaniak. I'm the head of Artificial Intelligence Department at NASC, the research and um, 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 the research institute uh, in Warsaw, Poland, and I'm also an assistant professor um, of the Faculty of Computer Science and Telecommunications at Krakow University of Technology. Before I introduce my introduce my honored speakers, I would like to emphasize the importance of the topic uh, of our panel session, and the topic is uh, the importance and challenges of medical data privacy protection in the era of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so the fourth industrial revolution represents a fundamental change in the way we live, work, and relate to one another. It is a new chapter in uh, human development enabled by extraordinary technological advances compared with those of the first, second, and the third industrial revolutions. The fourth industrial revolution is about, is more about, more than just technology a driven change. It actually is a, an opportunity to help everyone to harness converging technologies, technologies in order to create an inclusive, human-centered, uh, human-oriented future. Unlike other industrial revolutions, this one deals more with information, device to device, machine to machine communications, after generate, preserve, and share private information. And in order for the fourth industrial revolution to be a success in healthcare, critical data uh, and systems must be adequately secured and protected. And artificial intelligence is a key driver of the fourth industrial revolution. Artificial intelligence has the potential to revolutionize healthcare and help address many challenges. It uh, can lead to better healthcare outcomes and improve the productivity and efficiency of care delivery. And at the same time, questions have been raised about the impact AI could have on patients, practitioners, and health systems, and about, and about its uh, potential risks, ethics around high, how AI systems and the data that are needed to make AI possible should be used. And the challenges in making medical data public, of course, have become increasingly important in order for the data-driven biomedical research, research um, you know, to advance. And the main issues that need to be addressed to ensure the successful use of AI in healthcare are data access, privacy of data, bias, integration. And these are the main factors that have affected the use of AI in healthcare. And healthcare data, medical data, is highly sensitive, and it is a subject to regulations such as the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which aims to ensure patients' privacy. And the first important step to adhere to these regulations, and also in order to incorporate privacy concerns, is anonymization which is a process of removing personal identifiers. It is a type of information sanitization whose intent is privacy protection. It is the process of removing personally um, identifiable information from data sets so that the people whom the data describe may remain anonymous. And once data is truly anonymized and individuals are no longer identifiable, the data will not fall within the scope of the GDPR. And of course, it will become easier uh, to use. And anonymization that meets current standards can therefore be presented to legal authorities as evidence that responsibility has been taken toward patients seriously. 
And anonymization is extremely relevant in the case for the data used for secondary purposes. And here, secondary purposes are generally understood to be purposes that are actually not related to um, you know, providing uh, patients care. Um, they are, what I mean by secondary purposes is uh, research, public health certification or accreditation marketing, for example, would also be considered as a secondary purpose. So we do take it for granted that sharing of healthcare data for the purposes of data analysis and research also does have many benefits. However, the question is how to do it in a way to protect individual privacy and at the same time ensure that the data is of sufficient quality, that the analytics are useful and meaningful. This panel discussion is concerned with proper data protection, such as anonymization, while respecting applicable legal and ethical uh, guidelines. And now I would like to ask my honored uh, speakers for their introductory words. And I will start with Dr. David Koff. Um, uh, he's a radiologist professor uh, from McMaster University, Ontario, Canada. David. Yeah, thank you very much, Ilona, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to participate in this panel. I think you are addressing a very important topic. And uh, I'm very happy and proud to be part of that. So to give it a bit more background, as Ilona said, I'm a radiologist by training. I've been the, the past chief and chair of the Department of Radiology at McMaster University, uh, a large department of uh, now almost 80 radiologists uh, spread over six hospitals. But I, I had, uh, and I still have uh, more than ever, a passion for um, a, a topic which I think is very important, which is the communication of medical images and uh, the integration of uh, images in the, our workflow. So I'm the founder and director of uh, MIRCAM, the Medical Imaging Informatics Research Center at McMaster. And I spent more than 25 years uh, working on uh, different uh, uh, topics like uh, validation <coughs> of technology, um, research around radiation risk, uh, uh, new ways uh, to uh, uh, move uh, and compress images. And that's uh, how uh, we uh, uh, met, uh, I think, 10 years ago uh, when uh, Ilona was working on uh, image compression. Um, and uh, also uh, worked on um, the new standards. I've been uh, co-chair of uh, Aichi Radiology International. Aichi is uh, integrating the healthcare enterprise. Uh, I created Aichi Canada in 2003. Um, I also uh, created uh, something called Canada Safe Imaging, where uh, we worked on uh, radiation safety. I had the project around artificial intelligence uh, uh, used uh, to address uh, uh, the uh, risk of low-dose radiation. And uh, through this project, we had to access uh, millions of uh, data and so deal with the uh, issue of uh, uh, safety and uh, anonymization. So that's another uh, topic. Um, and uh, so basically, and I'm still very involved with, uh, with uh, other projects uh, where uh, anonymization and uh, the identification is a key to our success. So that's in a nutshell for me. Thank you very much, David. Uh, another speaker of our today roundtable is Dr. Eva kaviak Javor from Poland. Uh, she's a sociologist from the Center for Technology Assessment uh, from Łukasiewicz Research Network from the Institute of Organization and Management in Industry. Eva. Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me to uh, take a part in the, such a great discussion. It's a really honor to me to take a part in this event with such a wonderful guests. Um, as uh, Ilona said, uh, my name is Eva Kavia-Kiavo and, and I represent the Center for Technology Assessment, which is a part of the Łukasiewicz Research Network. Uh, I'm a sociologist, but I'm also a PhD in health science and I conduct research in the field of technology adaptation and technology implementation in aspect of health and medicine. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the topic of using medical data in health policy planning, but 
uh, also uh, connecting uh, with um, AM Health and e health in aspect of collecting data and using them for uh, another research or policy planning. Uh, I'm also um, a specialist of um, uh, sociologist and statistical analyst uh, in the nutrition department of Institute of Mother and Child. So I have also this statistic background of using data to analyze in, in research uh, aspects, especially in planning the um, nutrition uh, patterns. So um, I also um, uh, a part, take a part in uh, one of um, um, research connecting with evaluation of uh, vaccine, pro vaccine <coughs> vaccination program connected with COVID-19 in Poland. So we also analyze data connecting uh, also with uh, that uh, aspect. So many, many, many aspects for connecting with health, public health and medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. That's very interesting. Uh, so my third uh, honored speaker is Professor David de la Torre. He's a full professor for, of artificial intelligence and applied mathematics. He's the director of the Schema Artificial Intelligence Institute and um, from France, uh, Davide. Yeah, hello, good evening. Uh, thanks, Ilona, for uh, inviting me and uh, um, the introduction as well. Um, so uh, let me briefly introduce what uh, we do, what I do in terms of research. Uh, so my name is uh, David de la Torre and I'm actually uh, the um, director of the Artificial Intelligence Institute at the Schema Business School, which is uh, an interdisciplinary artificial intelligence institute that has been created almost two years ago. Um, the idea uh, essentially to respond to two different questions and two different uh, uh, issues. One was actually um, the fact that artificial intelligence, of course, is becoming more and more important, not only for uh, classical uh, um, let's say fundamental areas, but also for other uh, disciplines. So uh, in France, a lot of business schools now are launching a different institute that are related to our applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to finance and schema uh, as well. And uh, of course, uh, um, the, 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 the other uh, reason for which this center was created is it also to um, go to move along with uh, um, the, the fact that in this region, in Nice, and uh, so Sophia Antipolis, where I am right now, uh, actually is one of the main hub in France for artificial intelligence and has been uh, funded by the French government uh, 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 five years ago uh, to create this uh, hub and uh, of course to uh, sustain all kind of uh, AI related activities. Um, so Scheme is also contributing. Uh, it's a business school with uh, several campus worldwide. We have one campus here in Sofia Antipolis, uh, but the, the Artificial Intelligence Institute is actually a cross campus initiative. So we have uh, uh, colleagues uh, in Paris and Lille, and these are the three main campuses we have in France. And then uh, we have colleagues in Brazil, uh, where we have one campus in Raleigh, North Carolina, and in Montreal in Canada. And we also have two campuses in China, uh, where there are, we have other colleagues uh, uh, related to AI and, uh, and data science. Now, um, the interest, uh, uh, my interest actually for artificial intelligence, actually, I started many years ago. At that time, we didn't call it artificial intelligence. It was, uh, uh, I mean, probably separated in uh, fundamental uh, areas. And uh, as um, David and Ilona, uh, my connection with Canada are actually going back to the University of Waterloo, uh, where I spent a lot, of, a long time uh, in the past, and uh, uh, a lot of co-authors uh, of my papers are actually from uh, the Department of Applied Mathematics and Department of Electrical Engineering at University of Waterloo. Um, so uh, for a long time, I, I'm a mathematician by training, and uh, uh, my PhD goes back to 2001. And for the last, for the past 20 years, I've been working on uh, image analysis and applications of image different areas. Uh, we have been doing uh, uh, things, uh, uh, of course, the initial uh, uh, application, I mean, and the initial interest for images was essentially uh, motivated by the fact that uh, um, 
the group at the Department of Applied Mathematics was, uh, you know, composed by several people with interest in fractal image analysis. Uh, actually, for uh, probably not all of you know that the fact that uh, fractals for a long time have been used for describing images because of the beautiful mathematical properties that you have with this kind of object, the possibility to compress images with an extremely great compression rate, the possibility of extracting features from images. Uh, fractals have been used with application to medicine for a long time. And uh, of course, over the years, uh, we've been doing uh, uh, work, we've been working on fractals and, uh, you know, related areas. And uh, this actually been developed over uh, different years and evolving towards different techniques. And, uh, and the other thing that actually motivated my interest in, uh, in uh, AI is uh, from the optimization point of view, uh, because um, actually, uh, if you think uh, at the end of the day, once you think about uh, doing uh, uh, image uh, um, when you think about uh, uh, training, uh, machine training, uh, machine learning, at the end of the day, what we are doing is solving an optimization problem. So for those uh, uh, in optimization and related areas that have been working like myself and uh, solving problems with uh, uh, multiple equi multiple minima, and uh, this has been actually a nice area of, uh, of applications. So actually over the years, I developed this interest and uh, now as a head director of this uh, uh, center, I have also developed the possibility, I mean, and the interest towards different applications of AI. Of course, because we are in a business school, we do uh, applications of, uh, um, of AI to finance, marketing, uh, business, uh, human resource management, classical, let's say, int uh, interest, uh, research in uh, areas of interest for a business school. But we are also, I'm also doing other things that could be considered a little bit more line, but they could have a lot of uh, nice uh, application in the next years to come, like, uh, for instance, the application of uh, face recognition, extraction of emotions from images in their application to marketing, for instance, how to, uh, say, a, being able to address a certain marketing campaign based on the fact that uh, you extract a certain emotions that you prefer customer based on the emotions, or even being like in finance, being able to uh, define what is the risk aversion of a potential investor based on his uh, or her reaction uh, towards a certain investor, so rather than uh, calculating or uh, uh, estimating what could be the risk aversion in classical financial modeling, this could be done by using uh, extracting uh, uh, features from images, uh, you know, and our emotions from images. So uh, I, I, this, I would say that we have uh, an interdisciplinary group, uh, we are doing uh, uh, a lot of of uh, uh, things related to AI. And uh, uh, again, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you today. Thank you very much, Davide. As a mathematician, I can also appreciate the beauty of the mathematical depth. Uh, and yes, we do have some uh, research connections as well with Davide and with David as well. So it's my pleasure to welcome you here and to have this discussion on, on this important topic. Uh, unfortunately, two of our other uh, honored guests, speakers are unable to join us um, for technical reasons. And um, yes, uh, so let's have this discussion uh, on the topic of, of this panel. So uh, yes, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, let me go back to the, to the again, to the, to the main topic of our panel, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, technology-driven change. And AI, of course, is the, is the key driver. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, of course, is changing the way healthcare is understood, transforming the methods of treatment and diagnosis, as well as the relationship between health professionals and patients and altering the management and organization of health system. The first topic that we will discuss here is the need to access um, and expand uh, sufficient high quality uh, representative healthcare data. That need is increasingly growing and uh, it poses a significant challenge in the process of development AI tools and industry uh, standards. And here, maybe I will start with Eva to elaborate on that on that topic, uh, the ethical aspect. So let's, let's start there and uh, balance between data privacy and the development of data-driven research. Eva. 
Yes, yes, we, we all of us have a different background. So I, I'm looking on the data and the data using from the so social perspective and um, also ethical ones. So uh, as you said, part of such a big change we have now, uh, we must remember that the rights of the patient is the, the more important thing that we have to remember about that. So it is important to discuss some ethical standards to data use more often. So uh, there is a need to strike a balance so you between uh, individual privacy rights uh, and the possibility of using data in research or in health policy planning uh, so uh, we have to consider where is the line between a good of individual and a good of society we have to find that that, um, that line and um, and just discuss how we can protect a patient right in that situation so before we start thinking about all technical, mathematical aspects of data protection, of anonymization, so we have to remember that, um, that we have to consider who and where will be the right to access this data and what will be the main purpose to use it. Thank you, Eva. And maybe now let's move on to the quality of the data that is being that needs to be uh, transmitted over networks, that needs to be stored uh, for remote diagnosis and research innovations. Maybe David, uh, you would like to elaborate on that, on that topic? David, your microphone is muted. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> muted. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, I'd like to go back to the fourth industrial revolution, if, if you don't mind, uh, because I think we are living a, a very exciting time. And unfortunately, in part because of this pandemic, uh, which uh, didn't happen in a very long time, but that has uh, helped us to push the, the limit of uh, uh, our new ways of communicating. And so the first thing I'd like to do is to say, we, we have to look at the, uh, this uh, new development from two uh, sides. One is the clinical side, which is uh, what use do we do with the, the data and how do we uh, function around the patient uh, now that uh, uh, mainly for us in Canada, we've seen a lot of consultation being uh, provided online where there is no physical contact with the patient anymore. And for the past two years, uh, a lot uh, of telehealth applications have uh, uh, seen a, a huge increase to the point where it will probably become part of the mainstream and uh, it, it will be difficult to go back because uh, a lot of that has showed uh, a huge efficiency and uh, saved that time and in, in terms of transfers. So it worked really well. The other side is research and education. And what do we do with the data for research and education? So I think we need to draw the line between the two. It's not exactly the same thing. And the, the clinical aspect of things has been developed uh, over the past 20 years and has really shown its, uh, its huge interest now over the past two years. But that has been a lot of work to get to that point. On the research side, um, we've seen uh, the artificial intelligence uh, just growing to a point where there are so many applications. Uh, now, last time I went to the Radiology Society of North America, uh, which is the largest meeting of, uh, of radiology uh, in the world, um, there was a, a full flow dedicated to artificial intelligence with more than 100 uh, companies developing solutions just for radiology. And uh, uh, they raised, uh, I think at that time, and it was two years ago, more than $1.3 billion just to develop AI application. And the big issue we have when we look at that is uh, to develop these solutions, you need to have access to data because you have to use real data to be able to, to, to create them and, and validate. So I think it's it's critical to make sure that the data which are used for this development are of good quality. You want to have, uh, um, when we talk about radiology images, which are native DICOM, you don't uh, you want to try to avoid any kind of processing. The study we did on image compression was mostly to assess the uh, subjective uh, capacity of a radiologist to use compressed images to to get to a good diagnosis. 
uses, but does it work for artificial intelligence and uh, mathematical developers? I'm not sure. I think you really want to have the true uh, value of your image. You don't want too much degradation on that. And then there's another thing which uh, I, I heard a lot working with our engineering colleagues uh, is the assumption that the truth is in the radiology report, which may be, uh, you know, but it's not absolute. And you need to have as much data as possible to validate uh, your diagnosis if you want to have high quality development. So you need to have access to a surgical report, pathology report, lab results, the, the, patient notes, progress notes, a lot of information which should be um, aggregated to, to get uh, good quality. So having highly curated data uh, labeled, because you, you, you want to know where is the lesion that you'll be trying to find. Um, and even if uh, some uh, artificial intelligence model self-educate and can find this lesion by themselves, you still need to have a very strong and, and high quality data. So maybe I'll tell you about the project I'm working on, but this is really what we are, we are trying to achieve uh, uh, here. Thank you very much, uh, David. Yes, so before we talk about anonymization, of course, access to data is critical. This is exactly where uh, sometimes it is difficult to move from research to the real world. And this is the main problem. And of course, we'll talk about the uh, ethical issues with the privacy protection of data. And these are the main problems uh, which do not allow the access of public access to, to, to all the data that is needed to train um, artificial intelligence models and system. As we know, because data is, the, is without data, without historical data, we cannot have um, good predictive modeling. We cannot, any, we cannot really train any artificial intelligence models. So uh, yes, this is absolutely um, very important. And of course, quality of images. And another thing that I would like to mention here, and how do we measure quality of, of medical images? Of course, this is another uh, topic of, of research. Um, and, and that also requires special consideration for this type of images because they are very special. They are much different than the regular natural scene images. They have different uh, type of contrast and, and they do require special treatment. And maybe I will ask Davide uh, to uh, comment on this, maybe the relationship between medical doctors and patients to continue on, the, on our topic. Well, thanks, Ilona. Yeah. Well, first, before going into this, I would like to briefly mention the fact that, uh, you know, going back to what David was saying, and in general, on, you know, the topic that we are discussing now about uh, quality of images and uh, uh, degradation of images. Actually, uh, one of the topics where uh, we've been, in, you know, working for a long time is actually the denoise, right? The denoising of images. And this is such an important thing because when you get, uh, uh, as you said, you know, it's extremely important to know what is, you know, to get a high quality, good quality images to be able to train uh, algorithm and uh, but I mean the, the, the you know the 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 images are typically collected from devices that are subject to noise are subject to uh, errors right so uh, the, the image denoise is actually an important uh, step before arriving into a situation where you have something that you can be, can be used as a you know sample and to be you know to be used for training a machine now we've been working on image analysis image uh, um, denoising for a long time uh, as you said Ilona uh, medical images in particular MRI images and all the kind of you know, images that are coming from this kind of devices are very peculiar, you know, very particular. Uh, even from a mathematical perspective, have been uh, are extremely interesting because uh, with respect to classical images, for instance, they don't have the classical characteristic that, uh, you know, you have a color associated with the pixel, but actually in the case of MRI, because of the particular structure and you get uh, all these different slices are actually uh, mathematically, it's much better to use tools that are uh, essentially trying to take into consideration the possibility of, uh, for, you know, a water molecule, that is typically what we do with this kind of devices uh, to uh, detect the probability that we, the water molecule will move along a certain direction. This kind of framework is actually uh, different than uh, classical computer screen or mathematical tools that are used for computer screen. So uh, we have been doing uh, a lot of work in this area because uh, uh, actually we were, we wanted to find the right framework to describe this kind of object uh, in such a way that it was possible then to 
implement the noising algorithm, like the, I mean, total variation uh, minimization algorithm is one of the classical one in these different variants. Uh, but I mean, for being able to, um, uh, you, uh, to use this algorithm within the setting of medical images actually re require some work because uh, uh, these images, as I said, have to be described in terms of a mathem complex mathematical structures. So you need to adapt to what we mean image denoising and total variation minimization for these particular objects. So uh, that was uh, is kind of ongoing research. Uh, we, you know, as a group last year, we published a paper in 20, December 2020 related to this denoising of MRI images uh, using a particular uh, mathematical framework that we call uh, measure valued images. Uh, and we showed the goodness of our approach uh, and the denoising uh, approach uh, for uh, using particular data set uh, from the Stanford uh, repository. Uh, so it was uh, actually, it's still a in really interesting uh, research topic where there is a lot of uh, work to be done before actually arriving to the case in which, uh, uh, as I said before, you sample, uh, you, you get your sample of images that can be used for, uh, for training. So this is from one side, and then going back to what you were saying before, uh, you know, the quality of image is extremely important, uh, in particular, any time that we have to, to deal with the medicine. Uh, of course, in other areas, uh, right, uh, you know, it's important that, that the quality of data that we get, but in certain areas like medicine is probably more important than others. In particular, uh, I've been working recently with colleagues, uh, uh, psychologists, on uh, uh, the importance of uh, the relationship between uh, and AI you know, uh, the role of AI in, in the relationship between a medical doctor and the, and the patient. And of course, uh, this is, uh, I mean, extremely important because nowadays uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, solutions uh, are coming from uh, medical devices, are coming from uh, uh, machines that have been training on, uh, on data. And uh, of course, the quality of the data will reflect then afterwards in the kind of, uh, you know, decision that the machine is going to take. So anytime that then comes into the moment where you have to say, okay, well, uh, the medical doctor has uh, this solution available. Is it going to move along this de decision, uh, adopt this decision, change this decision? So really the uh, trust that you can have into the data and the algorithm is essentially affecting the relationship between a patient and doctor. And actually, you know, there are people that are talking about, uh, you know, the so-called uh, um, third element, the third actor into this relationship, because actually AI is playing exactly this, uh, this role, right? It's entering into the relationship between medical doctor, uh, doctors and patients and uh, is playing a role that has to be still to be defined. I mean, uh, I had, uh, uh, I gave a seminar, I think it was two weeks ago to students in the Master for Artificial in Intelligence for Cancer Medicine. And uh, um, of course, uh, you know, with, uh, I try to, stimulate the discussion saying that what happens if a medical doctor one day will be replaced by machine and uh, <clears throat> of course um, you know, people are were getting excited because they said, oh, look, at you know, we don't want the machine to take our job. But uh, at the end, uh, you know, it's still a, it's a topic that is uh, uh, attracting a lot of attention, not only because there are more and more uh, available tools from the algorithm point of view, machine point of view, uh, data quality point of view, but also because this is actually affecting human being. So, and the relationship between humans, uh, human and, and machines. So actually this is, uh, uh, as I said before, AI now, is no longer, I mean, simply the merging of probably the three fundamental disciplines, statistics, mathematics, and computer science, but uh, is actually becoming something more and more complicated. And the moment we start having, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in having intersection with, uh, with our everyday life, is actually becoming more and more important to what is uh, the relationship of these uh, uh, tools with respect to, uh, you know, humans. And actually, you know, at the end of the day, the discussion, even if it was a technical level, lesson, uh, you know, became like uh, talking about how much we have uh, to trust this, uh, what is the importance of human touch into the relationship between medical doctor and patient. Uh, if uh, from a psychological point of view, it's easy for a patient to, to know that he has to go through a cancer treatment, or uh, uh, if this is the same thing, it can be, I mean, uh, information, this information can be obtained from a medical doctor, from a person, or from a machine. And uh, so all these kind of things that are, uh, I mean, we're humans at the end, right? So that's uh, it's uh, extremely important, uh, you know, to be able to um, to uh, come up with uh, a solution that actually try to get the best from both uh, both perspective. Of course, uh, we have these tools available. We want to use them. Actually, medicine is using them more and more. Uh, but actually, there is a point where probably uh, you know uh, the replacement of humans becomes impossible. 
Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. I would like to also add that um, in general, uh, when we train uh, machine learning models, each data is uh, very specific to the area that uh, that is being studied. And in case of in the case of medical imaging, we also need medical doctors to provide the depth and understanding of, of, of the features that are important, diagnostic features that are important in order to study, to, to actually make any kind of predictions before we even start training the models. So yes, I totally um, uh, agree with you, Davide. Uh, so uh, it's not just statistics, it's not just mathematics and computer science, but also um, in general, artificial intelligence and needs um, many specialists from different areas, depending on the data that, that is being studied. Uh, and it needs to be uh, studied in depth. So it's, uh, now uh, I would like to move on to the second topic of our discussion, which is data bias, uh, integration, and the use of AI in supporting clinical decision-making. And before we talk uh, about um, the bias, I would like to give a general bias definition, what it means really, it, it is a deviation. Uh, from the truth. And it may happen when we have a sample data that does not represent, that do not represent a population, the population that is being uh, studied. Um, or for example, when the reported data does not represent the real world. And for, if, we, if, we have, if we're talking about an AI system, AI system, AI model will not be able to discriminate based on attributes and will not take into consideration, for example, minority populations, minority diseases, and minority manifestation of diseases. So with regards to bias, of course, we want we want this, our sample statistical sample, even like when we just talk about classical, classical statistics, we need the, our sample to represent the population um, that uh, we are studying and uh, the factors that could affect such uh, representativeness could be socioeconomic uh, factors uh, that represent the quality of data, regional, uh, genetic, um, lifestyle specific to a given um, population. And of course, we face these challenges uh, when we obtain these uh, uh, data sets, uh, representative uh, data sets. So maybe I will start with, uh, um, with David on data bias, please, from the radiologist's uh, perspective. Right. So uh, data bias is uh, definitely uh, about uh, how much uh, uh, attribute do we remove when we anonymize and uh, how much do we try to neutralize or to make uh, standardize the population. And as you said, Ilona, that doesn't work for AI development. Sometimes you, you, you will make the assumption that you take uh, a population of uh, 100,000, 300,000, and you'll average and, and you will end up thinking that everybody is, is kind of the same. But it's not true and we we find that uh, minorities uh, are uh, not uh, properly represented in large uh, data samples um, and minorities uh, doesn't mean only uh, uh, racial minorities or gender minorities or, but it's also disease minorities uh, and, um, and it's definitely more complicated to develop algorithms for rare, rare disease than uh, for, for standard things. So uh, that, that brings me really to the uh, next topic for research is uh, how much data do we need uh, uh, to make uh, research relevant? And how do we deal with this minority? Should we have uh, multiple small data sets of minority populations or what is considered as minority populations that uh, we can um, uh, include in, in a larger uh, research? So which means um, uh, replicating the same developments in different environments. Uh, so if we know that we want to uh, develop a lung nodule algorithm, for instance, yes, we will do it on the general population, but uh, are there are some people who will be more prone to develop a cancer than other people. And then should we uh, then uh, create smaller clusters? So that, that that's a pretty complicated issue. And we found out that talking about the bias, uh, um, element is, is much more complicated that, than we thought at the beginning and, and definitely has to be taken into consideration. So uh, how do we do that? 
um, it's still a, a very open discussion. We we had uh, um, a number of interventions. Uh, um, I don't have a solution for that, uh, and I, I I I would love to participate in more research on uh, how do we address the uh, the bias uh, uh, issues. But you know, it's like facial recognition, for instance, doesn't work the same way for everybody. It will work. Uh, it, it worked better on men than women, for instance, or um, uh, and uh, it may lead to to big disasters if you put people in jail in jail because you you make uh, wrong recognition. So we have to be careful with that too. Yes, uh, thank you very much, David. Yes, it's important to emphasize the risks uh, that could uh, come out of uh, biased data and and absolutely and especially. Uh, for medical use for medical purposes, and maybe uh, Eva, you would like to comment uh, on that as well. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. It's, it's very important when we think about uh, using the data, for example, for research in public health and policy planning. But um, it's um, that our, our today's discussion shows that we are totally in a different uh, uh, point um, of timeline of, of implementation of data using uh, in Canada and in Poland. In Poland, we have a, such a, a background uh, basic problem problems such an integration of data, access for data, medical data, uh, to, uh, to, 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 more, to use it for more um, statistic uh, purpose uh, to create a great, uh, better medical uh, research or create a good uh, policy, health policy. Uh, so um, when we consider these aspects of uh, bias, we have to remember about some demographic graphic aspect, but also the environmental uh, lifestyle aspects. Uh, and um, but but for us today in Poland, uh, access to data, it's more important access to the to good to good quality data, which can be um, analyzed in the statistic uh, operation. Um, which can be using for AI training, for example, if we not using our data for our social, um, our social specificity, uh, we cannot be uh, sure that that uh, AI algorithm will be proper for uh, our uh, process of training and for our process of treatment. Thank you very much, Eva and Davide. Would you like to? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe if, yeah, uh, I would like to add a couple of uh, actually sentences about what has been said so far uh, uh, about this, uh, this topic. Actually, uh, you know, data bias is extremely important, but I would like to mind the fact that uh, we have uh, with uh, artificial intelligence uh, one important issue that is related to uh, explainability right actually this uh, uh, in AI has become such an important uh, uh, topic and uh, actually we founded a name to describe this particular area that is called XAI explainable AI but now uh, for those uh, who don't know this part actually you know you, you have to think that in general I mean even if from a mathematical perspective I'm not uh, particularly obsessed by the fact that, uh, uh, you know, a certain algorithm is providing is associated with a certain bias, because I mean, at the end of the day is depending on how many you know, the sample size. So it's, uh, uh, it's perfectly understandable. But I mean, from the point of view, instead of, uh, you know, going back to what we were saying before, the fact that, uh, for instance, this algorithm are using in uh, uh, the relationship between medical doctor and patient and the algorithm, uh, maybe that is composed like, uh, in most of the cases, like, uh, I mean, a complex neural network with a lot of layers, a lot of neurons. And, uh, you know, the machine uh, at the end, after you press the button, says that, okay, you have to take a surgery. And, uh, and I mean, uh, especially when the, uh, the architecture is so complex, it's actually uh, come up, the, you know, the question that, you know, raise the question that, uh, I mean, how much uh, we can actually explain, right, to the patient, like uh, why the machine is saying this. I think it's quite difficult to say that, uh, oh, I mean, one million neurons were saying this, <laughs> so you have to take a surgery now so it's um it, this topic is becoming really really uh, important and uh, i mean the, the way that uh, uh, you know people are describing this particular problem they usually describe this uh, ai algorithm like uh, black box things where essentially you know uh, now the architecture has become so complex in terms of as i said the 
layers and structure of each layer that at the, at the end of the moment, at the end of the day, when it, once you train your, uh, your network and you say that, okay, now the network is providing this kind of forecast, it's difficult to say why it's doing that, right? And um, so this is an extremely, you know, important topic that moves along with, uh, you know, that data bias. I mean, uh, the fact that uh, even if you have the perfect data, you know, of the world, but the machine is still providing, uh, you know, this kind of problems, uh, at the end of the day, from uh, the, you know, the, the patient point of view or the person who actually needs to implement this decision, uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the, still there are a lot of problems to be solved, actually. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, of course, absolutely. And now maybe Eva, a little bit more from the sociologist uh, perspective about uh, the patients, how the patients respond to AI technology and supporting clinical decision making. Yes. Give you a couple more words. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. As, as Peter uh, said uh, before, the use of AI or any uh, e-health or m health solution has a strong influence on the doctor-patient relationships. So my research in this area showed that doctors are concerned using such a tools with um, they, they are afraid that will uh, that that tool will undermine his own decision uh, so on the other hand we have to pay, uh, remember that the patient uh, have to trust such a technologies why and how can they trust uh, if the doctors themselves are afraid to use them um, so you mentioned also the holistic uh, model of a personal care model uh, which are uh, the most important trend in um, reorganization of health model care. So uh, we have to remember that, that that model assumed greater participation of patient himself. So uh, in, in all treatment process. So they use, for example, the use of M health solution, a good example of, uh, of this um, process. So in that case, data protection, um, um, so in this type of software, it's meant not only for developer uh, application, but also for end users, patients. So we, it's, it's important to, to provide an property education of the patient. Um, we have, they have to know more about safety of using this type of tools, such as health, medical application. So it is important to, to, to get a protect of their data. Thank you very much. We can all see how complex this is, this topic. <laughs> and uh, so let's uh, move on to another topic, the next topic of our discussion, which is a uh, significant loss of the data utility due to excessive anonymization. And just to go back to the definition of anonymization, it refers to an irreversible transformation of data in order to prevent the identification of a particular individual. Mm, of course, irreversible, we mean here, by irreversible, we mean that it must be impossible to re-identify the person in question directly or indirectly. And uh, in the context of medical data, anonymized data refers to data from which the patient cannot be identified by the recipient of the information. And the name, for example, address and full postal code must be removed, of course, together with any other information, um, of course, uh, in conjunction with other data, yes, held by or disclosed to the recipient that could identify um, uh, the patient. And um, some uh, alternatives to anonymization, we hear these uh, terms, pseudonymization or um, de-identification and encryption. And maybe David, you would like to uh, talk about these um, different types and how do they differ? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Ilona, because this is really the big topic. And I know we don't have much time left to talk about that, <laughs> but I, I, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, this is uh, the major issue in, in our hospitals with the uh, privacy officer are so scared that they, that I can be leaked and people may have a way to re that uh, uh, they, they try to secure the data as much as possible. But that's not practical. And uh, I belong uh, to the uh, Canadian Association of Radiologists Artificial Intelligence Workgroup. And this workgroup has created uh, um, 
uh, subsection, which is the ethical and legal working group. So uh, they uh, uh, just issue a few statements. So to go back to uh, anonymization, and you gave the uh, uh, definition, but we, uh, um, I'd, I'd like to give the definition of de-identification, which is the process of transferring direct and indirect identifiers and possibly implementing additional controls so that the likelihood of data subject being correctly identified from the information is very small and not non-existing. So it's very small under the circumstances of use of disclosure. Uh, and HIPAA in uh, the states uh, list uh, the uh, identifiers we need to be removed uh, to keep the risk uh, uh, very small. The uh, critical and legal working group has made the decision to forego the use of the term anonymization. So we don't want to hear about anonymization anymore because that is something which just doesn't work. Having zero risk is like if you say the safe highway is a highway without cars. That cannot work. So if you want, you have to, to understand that there may be some risk. So um, the, uh, our uh, working group is recommended the use of the identification to be used in place of the word anonymization. And that the first recommendation that we came with, which is any custodian of patient data, such a, as a hospital, research facility, or health authority needs to be comfortable with a small level of risk that an individual's uh, information in the data set can be potentially re-identified. The only way to achieve a zero risk of re-identification is not to make any data available. Uh, and of course, we do. This idea would inhibit advancement of research and our understanding of medicine and would prevent AI from being developed in profession. Absolutely. So this is our position at the moment. And uh, we think that public data sets should be encouraged and released if the data can be de-identified to low re-identification risk. Public data sets promote openness, facilitate sharing, it, inspire national and international cohesiveness and give, give groups in engineering and computer science the opportunity to work with data that would otherwise only be available to medical professionals. In the end, public data set release facilitate more work on AI in healthcare, increasing the chances for life-saving AI to assist more people around the world. And that's exactly what we're doing. Me at my level with my, my uh, university, where we're developing a data set that we want to make public, which is why we're going through a huge extent to make sure that our privacy people are comfortable with the idea of de-identification and that we'll be able to publish the data on the cloud and our group at the Kenyan Association of Radiology at the same project to make it countrywide. So a countrywide project to have data sets made available for research and uh, uh, send boxes to train the uh, AI algorithm for everybody. So not uh, so we want to we want openness and we want to people to understand. Sure, there may be a small risk, but we have to live with that. There, there is no way we can uh, do any progress if you want to enclose everybody in the same. In a, in a... Absolutely, but this brings me to our next topic, which is actually defining some standards and um, for medical data sharing and collection uh, and. It, it, what about uh, David? Uh, about um, the uh, how, how it is done in Canada, the implicit versus explicit consent of uh, patients before the data is released, and this is very important to actually emphasize the contrast actually from Canada and Europe. So there are two aspects again, and I'm going back to what I said at the beginning: the clinical side, non-clinical side. So if you talk yeah. about uh, then uh, as long as the data, non-anonymized data, so the full data remain within the circle of care and are not accessed outside the circle of care, there is no need for consent. Consent is implied. And the only way uh, you can change that if, is if the patient expresses clearly in writing that he wants to remove his consent and doesn't want his data to be transferred. And as we do telehealth, the radiology, a lot of uh, remote consultation, access data on our digital image repository uh, to access the previous, we, there is no way we can ask patient consent. So this is the implied consent we have for clinical data. For non-clinical data, then 
Uh, the tree council, tree council is uh, CI Charin Circus is that uh, the main uh, research organization in Canada, which govern the ethical conduct for research. So they define the secondary use of data as the use in research of information originally collected for purpose other than the current intended purpose. So patient didn't give that consent for that either. Individual consent is the gold standard, of course, if we can get it with regard to use of medical information and is required by law when medical Medical data can link back to an identified individual. However, and that's a however, that's what I like in Canada. We have always have a however. Um, the treatment also defines when the secondary use of uh, medical data can be used without individual consent. And this is said um, in uh, uh, the policy statement. They don't mention clearly DNA identification but they just say, give a list of recommendations for what researchers should do. And uh, uh, this uh, section says the researcher will take appropriate measures to protect the privacy of individuals and to safeguard the identified uh, information. This is the de-identification and that's it. So no need for consent anymore. As long okay, as- Thank we... you. <laughs> well, it is different, yeah. Thank you uh, very much, uh, I... uh, David. Uh, GDPR, uh, from what I understand. Yeah, GDPR is a little bit different. It's, uh, yes, it's the uh, explicit, uh, it requires explicit consent. So the patient or the user must press on some kind of an agree button in order to, I mean, to give the consent to release the data. Um, so uh, we only have four minutes uh, till the end of our panel. So I would like to touch on some Two things, some more things that are very crucial and that are important. And one is um, over anonymization and how would that affect the training of uh, AI models? And two words, uh, maybe from uh, Davide on the federated uh, learning uh, versus anonymization in the context of medical data. Davide? Yeah, thanks. So, uh, well, actually, the, the idea of uh, um, uh, federated learning is actually coming from the fact that uh, many times once uh, when we wanted to train a certain machine, actually, we, uh, we it might happen that, uh, you know, the forecast that, that, this, forecast that this machine is producing is actually totally biased by the sample that we have taken into consideration. So this is actually uh, an idea that came, uh, uh, you know, has been re investigated recently, essentially to address two kinds of things. One is the idea that uh, we we wanted to avoid this uh, uh, problem related to the fact that if we have different data set and each data set, if we train a machine in each of them, that this will produce different forecasting. So how we combine them, right? How we, we can actually uh, determine if there is a kind of average solution among them. And the other one uh, is a strategy to the fact that because we have more and more data and because, I mean, the training process becomes more uh, slower and slower once you have a lot of data and you have to minimize your loss function over this big data set, one possibility is actually to split the training over the different data set and actually do this in parallel, do this kind of operation in parallel. So actually localize on each server uh, the possibility of uh, training a certain a single loss function and then combine again them at the end. And actually my group is doing some research on that because it's uh, we are uh, investigating how it's possible uh, to combine this kind of uh, different perspectives, different kind of loss functions uh, on, that have been trained on different data sets uh, using uh, techniques that are called multi-objective techniques. So essentially the idea is uh, to balance, to come up with the kind of uh, um, uh, model that is the the result of uh, a balanced combination of uh, the tr different machines that have been training on different data set. Now, of course, uh, this can have also an impact on uh, anonymization because uh, as uh, I wanted to add like, one, one thing about what David was saying actually before, uh, I agree on the fact that we, we should say that the probability of identification is always small because I mean, in principle, from a mathematical perspective, uh, uh, if you pay the price of stay forever, right? You can always uh, uh, 
de-anonymize a certain thing, right? That is the is the is the time at the end of the day of the problem. You know, to being able to uh, um, to uh, identify the key that is being used to encrypt a certain image uh, or the algorithm that has been used uh, is just a matter of the fact that uh, and this is used in a, in other areas as well. I mean, if you, this is taking forever, essentially you have protected your data, right? Because you will not be able to uh, decode or be able to identify the the the, the information in a certain amount of, uh, of time, a reasonable amount of time. Actually, the, um, the federated learning can move along this because can help uh, to uh, integrate the different, uh, you know, uh, recognition techniques, the, the, the techniques. And um, so we'll see what is going to happen in the future about that. But uh, I mean, federated learning is going to uh, offer a, a nice perspective to, as I said before, uh, to reduce the amount of time that is required for training and also to correct some bias that we have during the training process. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, to the speakers for joining me uh, in this discussion. And, uh, and uh, yes, our time is up. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ilona, again. Thank you, Ilona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to mention that we don't have a question on chat, but I encourage everyone to contact us via email or via our LinkedIn profile if that question will um, maybe later show. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank again. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye-bye.